Hello, welcome to the interesting podcast number four. Number four. That means we've put out a month's worth of content. That's pretty cool. Episode once a week, four weeks equals a month. That's some calendar math for you. Um, I hope you guys have been enjoying it. Um, we're actually almost at a, a hundred plays on my SoundCloud channel, so that's pretty amazing. Um, this episode is actually one of my best friends. His name's Victor Espinosa. He just recently published a novella called Greyheart. And um, Greyheart's really, really intense. It's awesome. Uh, if you like medieval um, battles, um, castles, uh, reimagining of elves, um, it's intense. It's intense. It's a, it's a quick read. Um, he's easily one of the best writers I know. And I think you guys are really going to enjoy him. He's um, He's just one of the best people I know. Uh, one of my closest friends, and we talk about uh, all all the troubles and stuff that he went through to get this thing published. Um, I think anybody out there who wants to publish their own book or anything will will really enjoy this because he really breaks it down um, about what to look out for, how he did a lot of the things. Um, obviously, we talk about Star Wars for a bit because, come on, I'm Jedi Brian. But I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Um, let me know what you guys think. I uh, really, really appreciate the continued support, and uh, you guys taking the time to check these things out. It's been a fun little creative endeavor. I really enjoyed doing these things, so um, I hope you guys enjoy listening to them, because I got quite a few uh, still on the way. Got a couple cosplayers coming up, and a couple other surprises. I hope you guys enjoy this, the interesting podcast number four, with author Victor Espinosa. Roll the theme song. And it's just like that. That's really cool. You just press record, just boop, and it's on. So I could say testing, and we would be testing or technically recording? Technically recording right now, correct? Awesome. I have a mint in my mouth that I'm trying not to... Yeah, I will be talking mind. around that as well. Yeah. <laughs> Do I need to hold this, like, right next to my face, or can I kind of, like... It'd be better to have it a little okay. right up on you. Just right up on you. Right up on you. We need you to straddle the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> pretend you're whispering. Uh, pretend you're whispering to me like at regular volume into the mic. Like, well, this is gonna get intimate. It's gonna get really intimate. <laughs> it, or it'll just turn into NPR. Just all, <laughs> all of your answers. Well, I wrote a book, and it's um, on sale now at Amazon. And I am currently sleeping and talking in my dreams. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's make this superficial. Author Victor G. Espinosa, the author of Greyheart and several other things you're going to enjoy in the future. Thanks for coming on my podcast. I have never been introduced as Victor G. Espinosa. That was. I read it on your cover. That was solid and that was smooth. That came out well, too. I okay. like that. I practiced. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you again. Because uh, this is official. You're like, dude, we're going to be pro- professionals here. Then we will try. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, we're. We're two minutes in, and we've already lost it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And by we, I mean me. All right, well, uh, tell me about the rap on your movie, Brian, because I haven't heard that much about that. I um, I was in a movie called Tethered, and I've talked about it on here a little bit, but it's a... That much I know. Yeah, it's a thriller. It was filmed in Fort Myers. It's about a dude on house arrest, and I play his best friend, one of the leads. It'll be on DVD... Later this year and Netflix next year, hopefully. It's a thriller. It's a thriller. Awesome. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. It was fun. It was fun. I learned a lot about how movies are made. Yeah. And uh, just seeing the pictures of you and the cast, um, it's easy to see on your guys' faces how much you enjoy the process. Oh, yeah. And I'm ridiculous. 
Have you seen any of the behind the scenes stuff? Uh, I saw a video, I think, of you just making as many weird faces in 30 seconds as possible. That sounds about right. We had this in the in the house that we filmed in. They had a house like for the production that we all filmed in. Right, right. And um, they have one of those like um, top bottom like uh, ovens. You know, it was like one on top, one on bottom. It was a really, really nice house. And I really hope it makes it into a behind the scenes thing. But I did this one thing where I would take the behind the scenes camera when nobody was using it, and I would just film myself walking around the set. <laughs> <laughs> and I did one where I went up to that that uh, that oven, and I was like. And this but this movie's got a pretty low budget, and it's because every penny that we had went to getting the exact replica of the one used in Deep Blue Sea. <laughs> LL Cool J went into this one and out of this one. <laughs> Dude, that's hilarious. I haven't seen it yet, but I really hope it makes it into the real. <laughs> I'm still laughing about. It. I laugh at my own jokes more than anyone else. More than <laughs> they're for me. <laughs> but you wrote a book, a novella. That's pretty awesome. I did. Uh, How long did it take you? I done it a while. I wrote the story originally when I was a shift supervisor at CBS. That was a while ago. That was a couple of years ago, um, and I was reading a lot of Game of Thrones at the moment. So the theme of people um, getting close and attached to the reader and then dying brutally was prevalent in my life. <laughs> um, I wrote most of it in, I think, like two afternoons. Um, really? Yeah, we were really dead those days. <laughs> you wrote it at CBS. Yeah, I wrote it at CBS <laughs> in the back room. Um, yeah, we were really dead those days. There was not much to do. Aaron was probably up front, or someone was up front, just right. taking care of the three customers we had for the six hours I was there, and I wrote in the back. Um, it was originally intended to be just the prologue to a much larger story, but I just kept going with it and going with it, and then it surpassed being a short story and turned into a novella. And I contemplated actually turning it into a full novel, there are a couple of characters that I could have put chapters from their point of views, but I decided to just leave it as a novella. Because um, I wanted to publish it kind of ASAP. Right. And to turn it into a novel would have been, you know, like writing a novel. Sure. So I just kept it a novella. So props to CBS. <laughs> props to CBS. <laughs> For housing the creativity. <laughs> um, yeah, and then... Um, Earlier this year, as I was looking through completed works that I had that I wanted to make more professional or really work on publishing, this one stood out. So I polished it up. I spent about a month polishing it up, hired a professional editor. Smart. And then learned everything that you have to do when you self-publish a book. Oh, yeah? How do you, how do you go about that? I'm sure it's an arduous process. It's a lot. There's a lot you got to do. Yeah. Um, I, like I. Yeah, I mean, you design the cover. You have to come up with the back description. You have to set up the publishing. You have to get the ISBN number. You have to format the physical copy and the Kindle version. You have to find the correct publisher. If that's indie and. Oh. That's not even like half of it. That's right. just what I remember because I blocked out so much of the other stuff. Right. <laughs> but um, it was a lot. It was a lot of process. It was a long stuff that you have to do. And normally traditional publishing um, takes care of everything else if you go through it that way. Yeah, if they've got like deadlines, you turn your stuff in and then they kind of take the ball from there. Pretty much, yeah. Like if, if, if there's a, an author bio that a website wants of you, you don't have to write it up yourself because... It, that's actually, I don't know, to make yourself sound professional and not showboat. All right. But also not really sound very humble and not talk about your exploits. It's kind of complicated. Sure. So Got to find that medium. When other people write about me, when other editors write about my author bio, it sounds a lot better than me writing about it. All right. So traditional publishers take care of all that stuff for you, and they write the back cover and synopsis and description and genre classification and whatever. That makes sense. That like self-publishing would be you have to do everything. You are the publisher, the salesperson, the editor, the writer, the artist. Man, 
I had um, I had this uh, Think Alike Productions. They do comics. They, they did the agency, the ones that I told you about with the okay. Egyptian. Okay. They I had them on, and they talked about what it takes to like self-publish a comic book. They're the exact same thing. It is all on you. There's no deadline. So if you want it out this time, get it out at this time. Exactly. It is all on you. If you want a comic book, you need to get it colored. You need to get it inked. You need the story. You need to fit it to the page. Then get it published. Then you have to call the comic stores and get it paid uh, to show up at their store. Mm -hmm. It's nuts. Yeah, I actually had planned to release it a month earlier than I did, but the yeah. editor took a week longer than expected, and then I found a paragraph that I wasn't happy with and started editing sentences in that for a couple of days. And Right. That's good, though. The more edits, I'm sure it got better. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah? Yeah, uh, you, you'll hear a lot of writers talk about how if they didn't have deadlines, they would always continue to edit and revise their story. Oh, okay. That George, makes sense. George Martin says that specifically if he did not have a deadline for his editor, he would always be reworking the Game of Thrones books. That makes sense. So Those are insane reads. Yeah. And Brandon Sanderson, it, when he's not happy with a book, he just rewrites it. Good same Lord. With, same with Patrick Rothfuss. And those are like 300,000 word books. Those are like Ooh. the large Harry Potter size novels. Those are huge books. Like, you know what? I don't like where this is going. I'm just going to start over. <laughs> that's pretty insane. Hey, yeah, that's just a waste of three and a half months of your life. Yeah. <laughs> Good Lord. So how's it been working with an editor? Because um, you've been writing stories as long as I've known you. I have, and I've always wanted to work with an editor. Yeah? Yes. Because I know that my stories are lacking, okay. I suppose. I know that my stories lack the crisp... Uh, knowledge of the English grammar and language. Gotcha. They can always be made better. Yes. Like okay. I, I can write some, some beautiful sentences and I can write some very well worded things, but there are always a lot of other ones that aren't or sentences that don't flow or they're super choppy or words that are repeated often. Gotcha. Um, and so editors are very helpful and, um, the best ones that I've worked with leave little comments on the edits that they send back. So they'll revise. Like they'll send me back the original and they'll send me back a revision. And on the revision, there will be tiny little comments next to most of their revisions explaining why they did this. And that's exactly what I want. That's perfect. Because then that helps me learn from that right. and do better in the future. As opposed to just getting, oh, I changed the sentence. You get a why. So you can, ah, oh, that's smart. That's awesome. How did you find an editor? Twitter. Yeah? The lovely world of the Twitter. The Twitterverse. Um, started following people that were in the writer universe profession. Okay. Um, and then publishers after that, and then editors after that, and agents after that, and then started seeing some tweets that an editor was saying, probably or kind of like um, posting what his services were. I checked it out. His prices were pretty cheap done deal that's awesome um these short stories that i have that have been accepted by magazines or the anthology the editor of that it works with me i don't have to hire or, or look for one he just contacts me and goes hey i like your story here's what i'm gonna change about it <laughs> and then and then it'll be good and then it'll be perfect and i'll put in the story so that's awesome so can you say anything about the anthology yet Yes, um, I uh, yeah uh, I wrote a short story for a contest that is a fantasy and science fiction anthology with the theme of eco tones, which means a boundary between two biomes or biospheres that interact. Okay. So it said, write a story that involves two cultures or two land masses, two countries that are right on the border, right, about something that involves right on that, that place where they interact with each other. Oh, that's cool. So I wrote a story about the sacred city of Ashurn, which is right on the border between a human-occupied space and an elf occupied space sweet and once a year they have this week-long feast in the city to celebrate a treaty that their races made 
hundreds of years ago. And um, it's just to kind of like honor that treaty and get drunk on joy and food and merriment. Right. That's so cool. It's, uh, I, yeah, I liked it. There's a little bit of racism there. And of course. Nice conflict and it's got to be. Some magic and some love. That's so cool. But I liked it. I enjoyed it. It was pretty cool. So that was for a contest. That was for a contest, yes. And then the winner got into the anthology. And the winner got into the anthology. Well, congratulations. Thank you very much. That's so cool. I'm and that was just a short story, not even a part of the novella. No. That's so cool. So you're working on a ton of stuff then. I do have a lot of other stuff, yes. Um, I was just notified earlier today of some submissions for a magazine that I submitted where uh, I got a personal message from one of the two editors of the uh, magazine saying, we didn't like this story, but we checked out your website and saw some of your other stuff and would welcome anything else you have to submit. What? Um, so, like, at first, I was kind of seeing the rejection letter, and I was like, man, I really like that story I sent them. I right. Really to go in. <laughs> but then as I kept reading, I realized that this wasn't, like, a typical rejection letter. It was kind of personal. And then it was my name. And then it was, we checked out some of your other stuff, and we would happily accept any of your other creative writing. Um, so now I'm thinking about what else I can, what else I can send them. Because they pay. What? Uh, I would like to be paid for writing. You know that means you're legally a professional writer. Oh yeah, like I make some money off my book. Enough to go out to dinner twice. So you're le you're legit a professional author right now. Um, that is so exciting. The science fiction magazine pays, but I will not get a check until my royalties pass fifty dollars. Sure. Um, and the anthology will pay, but that one is not planned to be released until like December. That's so awesome. So. That's so cool. I'm really excited about it. No, that's all that matters, as long as you're loving what you're doing. Oh, yes. You know, um, more than anything else. And I only just started really pushing into this seriously earlier this year. Yeah. So I'm starting meager. I'll start slow steps, get a couple of stories published, and then I'll keep moving on from there. This weekend I'm going to a writer's conference in Orlando. What? Where I there's going to be a lot of big names, both in traditional and self-publishing, that... I'm really excited to meet. So that is amazing. Yeah. Who are you most looking forward to seeing this weekend? Um, Orson Scott Card. Yeah. Or an author named Peter V. Brett. Um, Orson Scott Card is one of the bigger names in science fiction, and Peter V. Brett is a newer name in fantasy. Right. But has written some pretty awesome stuff. Anything you'd recommend from either of them? No. Yeah? <laughs> uh, not unless you're into giant space fantasy epics. That sounds pretty awesome. Um, Peter B. Brett writes some young adult. Yeah. Honestly, I, I'm just looking forward to meeting him. That's really cool. There are a lot of agents and uh, editors there as well that you can sit down and give them your manuscript and they'll go over the first couple of pages and critique it or tell you if they like it and if they represent a publisher and they like it they can give you their card right there and they can say yeah give me your card and we'll talk more that's a big deal that's a really big deal actually but there's also panels where you can sit down like at cons or something and the writers will talk about their craft or what they know best and you can listen to them for an hour or so glean some stuff off of them exactly it is a conference for horror and steampunk before fantasy and science fiction. Huh. So the first night there, there is a steampunk band performance troupe. Yeah, thing. Does a thing. <laughs> nice. I will not be going to that. Right. <laughs> I'll be in my hotel room writing. Not a big steampunk guy. Mm, yeah, you know. Right. It's interesting when I first found out about it. Like, what is. That's weird. It's a niche. It's cool. For sure. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Absolutely. They got cool costumes. Yes. Very, very intricate. Yes. I'm all about the leather. Yeah. <laughs> leather, valves, gauges. Yeah. Goggles. Those goggles. Oh, those goggles. Oh, yeah. That I wore in high school. <laughs> Me and Logan. <laughs> uh, I think back on that, and I'm like, we wore goggles to school. <laughs> like, every day. Often, yeah. 
But then again, I wore a Star Wars shirt every day to school my freshman year. And it was dubbed the Star Wars kid. Wait, really? Every single day? Every single day. I had like uh, 15 different shirts, and I would just switch them out. So, I mean, yeah, you know, 20 days or so of school in a month, 15 shirts. Yeah, pretty good selection. That works, yeah, I can see that working. Yeah, that's why I was a Star Wars kid, which was a title I earned and was proud of. <laughs> right on. Speaking of, you excited for Seven? Yes. I'm extremely excited. Some people are nervous, rightfully so. But I think it's going to be amazing. I can... Yeah. What do you think of the new X-Wing? Have you seen it? I've seen some pictures. There's a Poe Dameron, the new X-Wing pilot. He's got a black one. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've seen that. And I've seen the Legos for it. But... No, I, I, you got I'm this. excited for it. It's just that I am clearly not as excited for it as you are, Brian. Well, nobody's as excited as I am for it. <laughs> but also, like, I, I don't know. Like, I'm excited for it, but I don't want to spoil anything for myself. Right, absolutely. So. That makes sense. This is a little personal. Ah, yes. But yes. so, on one day on Facebook, when I jump on and see a bunch of information that you're posting about, like, behind-the-scenes stuff, I'm like, what? No, spoiler, <laughs> I don't want to know this. Oh, scroll down. I don't do any images. Because I, I actually, everything that I've seen has been stuff that Disney has released. Like, I won't watch, like, leaked footage, we found right, this one. I won't right, do that. Okay. Because I don't want to be spoiled of the plot. But everything that I know so far, I don't know a thing about the plot. I don't know what the story's about. I've seen the behind-the-scenes reel, which is what they released at Comic-Con. They're like, hey, everybody, watch this. So I've seen that, and I've seen both teasers that they released and the Instagram that Star Wars released. There was a book just released called Star Wars Aftermath. Yeah. That takes place um, supposedly right after the second Death Star was destroyed. Yeah. It's like. Is it any good? It's the new canon apparently, and it's what's supposed that makes to sense. bridge the gap from the movie to this coming movie. Huh. Wedge is one of the main characters, which is why. What? My interest. Um, Admiral Akbar is one of the main characters. Awesome. I love Akbar. I have an Akbar keychain. <laughs> and there's a couple of like random Republic characters, but it's supposed to bridge the gap. It's supposed to fill in a lot of holes. Hmm. Uh, I'm so proud of my Star Wars books. You should be. Good lord, that's a whole, it's whole a whole shelf. shelf. It's a, it actually needs to be two shelves because I don't I don't have enough to fit. What's your favorite Star Wars book? Psh, book or comic book? Can I do both? Do both. Knights of Republic. Of comics? Yeah. Oh, for sure. Mine as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's so good. Yeah, that's just phenomenal. Z Zane Carrick. Phenomenal. Um, that's John Jackson Miller, isn't it? I believe so. I, believe I love so. him so much. Dark Plagueis is a pretty darn good book. Well. Plagueis is fantastic. But uh, Paul S. Kemp writes um, some great stuff in Cross Current and Riptide. Yeah. And a lot, me and a lot of the people that I know that read this Star Wars EU before it was destroyed um, were really excited for what was about to happen in Paul S. Kemp's world. Really? Um, Luke was getting involved. Uh, the, the prophesied dark ones were about to come out and be revealed and all this crazy stuff was just about to come to a head. And it was tying gaps in between thousands of years later on in a comic series called The Crimson Empire was like what it was tying everything together and it was coming to a head and we were all like dude the next book is going to be so amazing and then um they scrapped it all and then they scrapped it all and now they're like surprise it's legends yeah now. everything's legend you know what the the legends banner hurt me most for mm -hmm. the kenobi book yeah i read that book dude how was it good yeah that's john jackson miller as well that also bridged the gap between crimson empire because really? it uh, talks about Obi Wan Kenobi meeting um, Lord Crate, who oh, okay. is uh, the Dark Lord when Luke Skywalker's grandson, Kate Skywalker, is like what becoming um, a Jedi. That is uh, crazy. Yeah, like he's uh, Darth Crate was this dude that left during the Clone Wars, and he lives with the Tusken Raiders for a bit, and he like hmm. becomes their leader, and then Obi Wan Kenobi finds him when he's Ben Kenobi. 
What? And uh, like chops off one of his arms and tells him that he's wrong. his go-to move. Yeah, basically, <laughs> because he's been fooling the Tuscan Raiders, uh, making them convince um, or telling them he can like control the wind and the elements. So they like worship him. They think he's like their their best warlord. And then Ben Kenobi shows up, chops his arm off. What? But then he goes, that guy goes into stasis for like a thousand years, comes out, gets spoken to by Revan and a bunch of other spirits of Dark Lords, and then becomes a Dark Lord. And then that is the comic series of the Crimson Empire. Um, that is amazing. And so there was stuff happening in Paul S. Kemp's world and in other world that was all tying. It was all coming together. <laughs> it was all going to come together. No, it's not. I remember... Um, when John Jackson Miller was saying he was going to write a Kenobi book, anytime he did press, or was on Twitter or Facebook or anything, like, is Qui-Gon going to be in it? Because we know he's got to be in it. He's got to be in there somewhere. At the end of episode three, he's like, I'll teach you to talk to Qui-Gon. Where's Qui-Gon? And he goes, well, let's just say he's not picking up the phone for most of the book. Oh, yes. No, at the, uh, at the end of each chapter, there is a part where uh, Ben meditates and tries to talk to Qui-Gon. Oh, that's so cool. At the end of each chapter, it's kind of like, or I guess not each chapter. At the end of each chapter, that's told from Ben's point of view. Oh, okay. Um, he goes home, and it's usually him sitting down, and he's trying to quiet his mind, and it's him reaching out to Qui Gon. Um, I think once or twice he tries to reach out to Yoda, but he it's him trying to reach out to Qui Gon, and all the way through the book, he doesn't get a response till the end. Oh, that's so cool. And so, like throughout the entire book, he's getting frustrated because he's starting to like it's like him talking about his day, and it's like him journaling basically, and then he's like, I don't know why I'm talking to you. I never get a response. I'm not even sure if you're listening. But sometimes he's like, I feel like you're almost there. Like, you're just hovering. You're uh, just, you're just there. And then at the end, he says something, and he gets a response, and he's like, you're right. I was right. You were right. Oh, my God. I can't take it. It was a really good book. It was really good. Oh, I'm so excited. I want a Kenobi movie. Now that they're doing spinoffs. Ewan McGregor said he would do it. Yeah, he would. He's like, I would do it. And then Liam Neeson's like, ah, if he came back. You know, I feel like we might be over flooded in Star Wars. I think we definitely will be. I'll give it... I think 7, 8, and 9 are going to be incredible. Because Disney paid $4.2 billion. I don't think they're going to mess up the trilogy. I think there's going to be some bad anthologies. Like, I think Rogue One's going to be really good. If they do a young Han Solo, I have lots of doubts. Huh. I don't want a young Han Solo movie. I don't want a Boba Fett movie. I actually... Uh, I think Jango Fett's a cooler character. I love Boba Fett. But I feel like Jango's actually Mandalorian. Like, raised from the tribe, legit. Yeah, you know? I feel like oh, they, if they were going to do a Mandalorian movie, they shouldn't focus on Jango or Boba. They That's should true. focus on, like, like, Mandalore? Yeah, like Mandalorians. They should call Mandalore. it Mandalore. Disney, by the way. That's so sweet. Call it Mandalore. Disney. <laughs> Disney, if you're listening, way, make a movie about ruthless bounty hunters that kill everyone and take no prisoners. Yeah, that start a war just for the stories. Yeah, they start a war just because they're bored and they feel like they can take over the entire galaxy. Just mention Clan Ordo once. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh man, they there were talks about a Boba Fett movie, but they said they had such a hard time making a movie about someone who they couldn't paint as the hero. Yeah. Because, like, how do you carry a movie about the bad guy? Obviously, you know? there's demand for it. It's just well, absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, there's nothing in the movies that suggest he's this, like, badass. I mean, Boba Fett, where? And then he gets hit in the back and then eaten by a Sarlacc, which I guess he got out. The books are great, but nothing in the movies suggests besides the fact that he, like, looks cool in the background. Yeah, besides that he looks really cool, yeah. Yeah. Right? It's like, he's like, done that obviously, before. Obviously, yeah, <laughs> we've had this problem before. Exactly. Okay, all right, I'm not going to disintegrate this guy. Jeez. Right? <laughs> no promises. <laughs> Watch it be that he actually never caught any of his bounties. He just disintegrated them and brought them back in the jar. Be like, this is totally them. Trust me. <laughs> or no, he's like, he's like a Spike Spiegel and Jet. They like, never, yeah. they like never get the bounty. They're always broke. <laughs> <laughs> that would be perfect. In the comics, he is awesome. In the comics, Absolutely. He's, he's like the number one bounty hunter in the guild of bounty hunters. Which is pretty awesome. Which is so cool. I don't know. And he he's been at it up. for a while. Hmm? He's been at it for a while. Yes. Uh, and he likes to freak people out sometimes by showing up without his armor on. So that oh. when they see him, he's, he's just this like scarred, 
mutated <laughs> fleshless thing. Oh, that that's like sick. wrappings all over them, and they're like, "Who are you? I was supposed to be Boba Fett here." And he's like, "Yeah." <laughs> Holy crap! <laughs> ah! Oh man, is he your favorite Star Wars character, or is Plo Koon? Plo Koon is interesting, but uh, I I gotta say I have mad mad respect for Wedge Antilles. Yeah, Wedge is your favorite. Just because he, he don't got no force. It's true. He don't got no force, and no one can kill him. <laughs> no one because he's that him. good. He's the best pilot in the Republic. He's like the dutiful soldier version of Han Solo. It's, uh, yeah. And he's hilarious. <laughs> and in a lot of books, sometimes other pilots will be pitted against him. And there's been a couple of cases where the pilots don't know that it's Wedge. And they'll... They'll just be cursing with frustration at this pilot who somehow knows how to dodge everything they're about to do. Who somehow knows, like, everything they're about to do. They're like, this must be controlled by a computer. This must be a Jedi. This must be... And then they see Wedge in the cockpit. He's just waving. And they're like, oh my gosh, no wonder this person is so flipping good. Wedge just cannot die. That's so cool. I don't know. You put him in, like... Put him in like a, an inner tube and throw him in space, and he'll still find a way to get past the super star destroyer. That's insane. It's too awesome. I actually don't know a whole lot about Wedge outside of the movies. There's not, there's like nothing to know about him. Yeah. In the movies. Yeah. True. 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 It's just hey, there's that guy. Right. Oh look, it's Wedge. That other movie. He was yeah. good, right? He's in Red Squadron. <laughs> yeah. No, only really true nerds. Only true nerds that have read the Tank Book series that involves the X Wing series. Yeah. It's him. Gotcha. That makes sense. Aaron I've, Allison all the way. Because I've read some comics with him, yes. but I but I haven't read the books. Yeah. yeah. Not that series. No, which is Blue Coon is though probably my favorite Jedi. He's really awesome. Blue Coon is so cool. The Keldor Jedi. Yes. So cool. And then um X Arcoon is my favorite. Really? Double bladed blue lightsaber? Fought Double in the Senate. bladed blue lightsaber. Fallen Jedi. Super evil. Yeah, super evil. Xar Kun's pretty intense. Yeah. I always like Count Dooku. Really? I always like Count Dooku. He's my favorite Sith. Is it because of his lightsaber? His lightsaber is really cool. No, I like the fact that he was one of the best duelists the Jedi Order ever saw. So much so that, like, if you watch episode two, when Obi-Wan is in the library, he's about to be like, I can't find Kamino, there's a blank space here. And she's like, if it's not in our records, it doesn't exist. It's like, it shows what you know. Uh, he's, at the beginning of that scene, he's actually looking at a bust, like, statue right. of Count Dooku. Right. So Count Dooku's so good at dueling, like, with that lightsaber, there's a statue of him in the archives. Well. That's pretty awesome. Even in the Darth Plagueis book, it speaks highly of him. Oh, yeah. The fact that, like, he's of noble birth, he's a count, and was, like, with all of it. Before he was a Jedi, he was wealthy and prestigious enough to, like, inherit a planet. Yeah. And so when the Jedi Order started doing stuff he didn't agree with, he was like, you know what? I'm going to go back and be a count. And, right. Uh, <laughs> on my planet, so screw you guys. Exactly. It's always like that. And, I mean, he trained qui -Gon. That's just bonus points. Okay. So, I liked him before that, but... That definitely sealed the deal. What about my Master Sifo Diaz? Mm, did you ever see the Clone Wars? The animated? Yeah, the no. series. Wait, wait, the movie? Not the movie. The series had like six seasons. Some of it here and there. There's an arc with Sifo Diaz in the end. Okay. But Palpatine's like kept him alive, and like what? he went nuts. He's just crazy. Oh, that sucks. It's crazy, and like in Plagueis, you know, Sifo Diaz just struck me more as like twitchy and kind of like paranoid okay you know it's okay. like uh i mean they're manipulating him obviously you know yeah. plagueis is like what would happen if the republic was attacked and he's like i i don't know i don't know oh god so <laughs> okay. is uh it's a little crazy for me x Arcoon's really cool um revan is also revan's cool do you see revan like because obviously like it's nice to the republic and there's two endings one where he's good one where he's bad do you see Revan as good or bad? I asked Mouse of this because she cosplays as Revan. It's like, at the end, what happened? Did Revan kill Malak to take the power and be the new Dark Lord of the Sith? Or 
did he kill Malik to save the Republic from the bigger threat? To you. I don't know. Yeah? Uh, to me, I always think back of... Uh, I always think back to when Revan became Revan. Okay. Um, like, in the Knights of the Old Republic series, he was just a nameless okay. Jedi. And all the Jedi went to a planet that they thought the Mandalorians were attacking. And when they got there, the planet was empty. It was uninhabitable. There was no one there. And as the Jedi were walking around, someone walked up to the ocean, to, like, uh, the shore on a beach in the ocean. And they found a Mandalorian's helmet. And he picked it up. And as he picked it up, every Jedi there had a force vision of what happened on the planet. Where the Mandalorians herded up the race that lived there, pushed them into the ocean, and then slaughtered them all. Cool. But before they did, one Mandalorian stood up to the king, Mandalore, and he said, we don't need to do this. This is a not a warrior's way to do this. We don't need to kill people this way. These aren't warriors. We're just slaughtering them. Right. And Mandalore said, I salute you for your opinion, and then he shot him. And so the Mandalorian died with the, all the other people. And that Jedi was holding that one Mandalorian's mask. And so the Jedi puts that mask on, and he raises his lightsaber up, and he says, we will not stop until the Mandalorians are dead, because they are obviously a huge threat to the galaxy. That Jedi is Revan. Oh, uh, okay. That Jedi that puts that mask on, that mask was originally a Mandalorian's helmet. I didn't even know that. That's and then, way cool. And then, he, that's, and then he leads the Jedi in fighting the Mandalorians. And then Malak, who also was a Jedi before changing his name to Malak, right. becomes his like right-hand man. And they kill the Mandalorians. And after they defeat the Mandalorians, they go, you know what, we're so powerful, we should just rule the galaxy anyways. Right, and then and the Jedi were wrong, and we're going to start the Jedi Civil War. And, all. and then Malak betrays Revan, and then Revan gets brainwashed. And right. Yeah, and then you have that going. So I always think of how Revan became Revan. Oh, okay. And I guess I would hope that he goes back to that. So he's more, to you, he's more of like a gray Jedi? Yeah. That's pretty yeah. awesome. I'm for it. I, I always, I mean, I always bring it back to Qui-Gon, because he was like the Jedi who didn't listen to any of the Jedi. Yeah. Like, he knew what was right. And he was all, and they're like, it's against the code. He goes, I don't care what the code says. This is what's right. And he just knew. Because, I mean, ultimately, the Jedi were wrong. Mm. You know, you even go back to, like, Episode 6, where, uh, like, Yoda and Obi-Wan were like, the only way is you got to kill Vader. That's it. That's the only option. And Luke is like, no, 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 I'm going to pick the next option that you're telling me I'm going to love him and redeem him, because he's redeemable. You know, so even at the end, the Jedi were wrong. Right. You know, love isn't this thing that brings you to the dark side. And, yeah, like, the Force is more important than just the Jedi's code. Absolutely. Which Qui-Gon got. That's why he was the first person who ever became one with the Force and beat death. That's so impressive as well. That's what, one of the biggest reasons why he's my favorite. Like, that dude was so in tune, he beat death. Like, what? Because, you know, obviously they believe that once you die, you become one with the Force. But he figured out a way to maintain his identity in the Force. Well, as a Jedi as well, like, the Sith, in the old times, the Sith had alchemy... Right, they could bond their spirit to their tombs, Nagasato. Yeah, and Revan does you know, as well. Revan as well. Like, um, in the online game, The Old Republic, they released a like expansion pack where there is a cult called the Followers of Revan, where they manage to gather most of his armor and resurrect his spirit. And he like inhabits the armor and starts to command them and tries to take over the galaxy again. And so the expansion what? is you stopping him and his cult of followers. That is nuts. It really made me want to play the game more. Would you ever write something, Star Wars? Because obviously we love it a lot, and you have I the ability. Yes, so. I mean, I never see that happening, but yes, I would. You're not against it? No. Because I would read the mess out of that story. That would be pretty interesting. I mean, I would not mind writing in a lot of different fandoms. Yeah. Because there are a lot of you know, there's a lot of fandoms that have books or that have comics that people don't realize. Right. Mass Effect has a lot of novels. And really. Comics. Firefly has comics. I know Firefly does. Um, Borderlands does. Gears of War has a bunch of novels. And then Star Wars has hundreds of novels. 
Yeah. But yeah, there's a lot of video games that I like, that I enjoy, that have novels attached to them or that have comics. I would not mind writing for a lot of different fandoms. So right now you're you've written fantasy mostly. Grey, fantasy Greyheart's mostly. fantasy. Yes. Fantasy there. Uh, I, I see myself pretty much as only ever writing fantasy and sci fi. Yeah? Why is that? Is that your comfort zone? I, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, is that just, that's what you like? That's your thing? Because you, that's cool. You, you write what you want to write. Like, you don't write to a market or you don't write for something else or for another reason. You write what you want to read. That's actually a great piece of advice for anyone who wants to get into writing. Yes. Above uh, all else, write what you want to write, not what you think people want to write. Yes. Like, what I am writing uh, right now is a novel that I want to read. So that, uh, that's why I'm really, really excited for it is because it's, like it's something I want to read, so I'm, I'm writing it as fast as I can so that way I can read it when it's done. And then maybe someone else will like it as well, but I don't know. That's really cool. They say that about movies as well. Like, if they're not making that movie, maybe you should be the one to make it. You know? That's cool. So, Greyheart. Greyheart is your book that's out. It's on Amazon. Where did you come up with the idea? That's a good question. Thanks, man. <laughs> I don't remember. Yeah? Just kind of float out at CBS while reading Game of Thrones? <laughs> yeah, um... And it and it's definitely branched out from my original idea of just I suppose I just had this scene of humans being told that they're about to be attacked by elves and the humans thinking, Okay, even though we haven't seen elves in a hundred years or so, what do we know about elves? They're fair skinned, they're kinda of pretty, they're, right. they're a little dainty, they live in the forest, uh I don't know, they, they like silk and soft clothes. They're not really rugged. They're not, they, they're not like hard. Right, <laughs> they're not dwarves. And then all of a sudden when the humans see the elves, the elves are not that at all. The elves are these crazy, frenzied, uh, half-demonized creatures that are cannibalistic and feel no pain. So the humans are suddenly uh, a little confused. This is not, these are not the elves we've ever heard of. What the hell has gone wrong here? And so instead of uh, hoping to entreat with them or talk with them, find out what's good, why do they want to attack, they're just forced to defend themselves from maniacal enemies. That is terrifying. Yeah. Like you think it's going to be this great, like, you know, Rivendell elves. <laughs> right, basically. And yeah. then you come across basically uh, an army of orcs. Because in that world, the humans and the elves, they haven't spoken, they haven't had contact in about a hundred years. And so when uh, a couple of villages inside of a forest that's right next to an elven country start to disappear, the humans start to wonder what's going on. And the, uh, the villages that are disappearing are in a line towards the city of Greyheart. So the king knows that Greyheart is the next place to go, so he sends a bunch of people there, a big army there. And like find out what's up with the elves. Maybe we can talk to them. Maybe we can we can parlay with them and find out what they want. But then when the elves leave the forest and they come out towards Greyheart, they're just crazy. So all I do is fight. Cool. Greyheart is a place. Greyheart is a city. Yes, it is okay. a fortified city made of nothing but gray stone. Oh, that's cool. So it's called Greyheart. Huh. That's so cool. Did you have to do any research before writing it? Like, I, what is this called? How would this sword swing? Yes. Um, I don't usually do any research until I have to. Right. Um, like, I just start writing the story until all of a sudden, oh, wait, is that how a commander would actually give orders? Or Right. Okay, let me look this up. Or uh, I would just write until, oh, wait, what's that place of a castle called? Isn't it? No, I think there's a special name for that, actually. And then I'd have to look up and go, oh, they're called crenellations. Or, oh, it's called the Bailey. Now I understand. Right. A portcullis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, what's the name of the gate thing? It's not a gate, but it's on the front of the gate. Oh, portcullis, yes. Okay, then there's the gate, and then there's other things. And then there's a barbicade, which is also in front of a portcullis. There's a moat, but not every place has a moat. There's a keep, then there's an inner keep. Right. What constitutes has a moat? <laughs> yes. What's a curtain wall, and what's a city wall? What, yeah. Um, 
where does the barricade go? Where does the barracks go? Where is it smart to put the stockade and the postern gate and whatever? So in designing Greyheart at first, it was just a, a big square city. Yeah. <laughs> and it was gray, and that's all I wanted. And then as I started to look into how places like that were actually designed, I had to put a keep and put walls and put towers and archers and a wall here, and there only needs to be this many gates, and it has to be near a river, and it needs to be a water source, and yada, yada, yada. Did you draw it out? I did. Get like a graph? Yes. Smart. And for the novel that I'm writing now, I have... A ton of notes on your wall? Not only that, I have... Uh, I downloaded a map making program on my computer that you can actually create a terrain, like a world. Oh, what? Um, and so I mapped out where mountains are, where a forest is, and then I drew where the city was and where their journey takes them and plotted out all this other stuff. And so, yeah, that, that helped a lot. Um, and in what I'm writing now, it's a much bigger city than Greyheart, and it doesn't get destroyed. Nice. <laughs> so uh, the story takes place in that city, and so I had to design where the academy was, where the marquis's house is, where the governor lives, where the fishing district is, and the market district, and the noble district, and yeah, 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 I had to plot out what city is, so. That's awesome. Awesome, and a lot of work. Oh, yeah, sounds like it. <laughs> but really fun as well, like, uh, you can pass four hours building a world really quickly. Sure. And then you get to play in it by writing a story around it. And then you make some characters, and you put some characters in the world, and you write it, and then you really hope that someone else wants to write it, and, or read it, and right. then they don't, and then your hopes are dashed. And, yeah. So, <laughs> so is the, who's the main character of Greyheart? I'm sure it follows at least one person. Okay. Who are your, who are your characters? I just realized. We were talking about Wedge Antilles a little bit earlier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I modeled uh, this character. His last name is Antilles. Oh, cool. Um, nice little homage. Yes. Uh, he is Lord Commander Peter Antilles. And he is the highest ranking member of the King's Royal Army. Okay. Um, and there's other, like, generals and there's other uh, commanders of specific parts of the army, but he is, like, the ultimate head. Okay. Um, and so the king has kind of put him in charge of going to Greyheart and making sure that it's defendable and that they survive. So Greyheart is like the first line of defense yes. for what's to be an attack. It's the first real city, and it's the first time that they actually meet elves in our account. And uh, it ends on a hell of a cliffhanger. Okay, cool. So everyone that's read it so far has been like, dude, this was really cool. What is wrong with you for ending it right there? <laughs> you could have just kept writing. Why did you do that? Um, so I am already writing the second one and plotting that out because that seems to be the only negative thing that anyone says is that it's quick and it just ends right when it was getting good. <laughs> so you need to write the second one. That's smart. It's like filming a pilot of a TV show. You know, make it halfway decent, end it on a cliffhanger so people want more. I kind of wanted that. I also, yeah, that's kind of was my intention, was as my first thing for people to read and go, wow, this was really good, I want more. Right. And then for them to always keep checking back and seeing what I'm doing and, and how I am producing more. That's pretty awesome. And you said you're working on a novel as well. I am... What can you say about the novel? What it's going to be about? I'm this close, Brian. <laughs> I'm so close. All right. Um, Only what you can say. You don't have to give anything away. Say, like, yeah, I can give you a synopsis. It is a... Uh, I'm not sure if it'll be young adult. Okay. I kind of don't want it to be young adult, but the main character is a 15-year-old kid. Okay. The story is about uh, a group of thieves, uh, a very professional thieves in a large fortified kind of medieval-ish city. It's fantasy. Okay. Uh, and magic is prevalent in this world. Sweet. Um, so it takes place kind of following this group of professional thieves in this city and the main character is this boy who um, went to the academy which is like Hogwarts. It's like the magical school. But he was expelled because he did some very naughty things. <laughs> um, and when he was expelled, he was brought back home, and his father is the governor in this large city. But his father is also kind of evil, 
And so he decided, I know enough to live on my own in the streets of the city. I know enough to make it on my own. So he runs away from home and he leaves the academy and he becomes a thief by himself on the streets for about a year. Okay. The story starts off with this main character. He's pretty accomplished as a thief. He has his own niche. He's been able to, to get some coin for good professional gear. He, he's not really starving anymore. He knows what he's doing. And so one day he decides to hit someone who he's been marking for a while and steal some magical items from him. But he does not realize that this person that he's about to steal from is the leader of the professional game of thieves. Ah. So he steals from him, and it goes wrong, and it goes kind of bad, but eventually the leader catches him and is kind of impressed with him. And it's like, you know, you actually, you have balls, kid. Right. right. That was actually pretty impressive. Um, and he kind of extends an invitation to the kid into his group. Hmm. Um, and the only reason he does that is because the kid has magic, basically. Uh, okay. He's um, an asset. Yes. The the leader of the group is also a mage, but he hates mages. Okay. Um, he doesn't trust other mages, and so he specifically is looking for a dropout of the academy. And it just so happens that... One walks into his path. Yeah. Huh. In, in this world, uh, there's like a conclave of mages. Right. Just kind of like if you're a mage and you want work and you want to uh, be accepted as a mage, you have to register with the conclave. That means you have to follow all these rules, you have to be followed a lot, you have to check in a lot, you can only do certain, there's a lot of regulations around it, and so there's a lot of mages that say F the conclave, right. and kind of hate it, and don't want to be registered. That is the main, or like the, the leader of the thieves group. Oh, okay. Um, and so that's why he doesn't like mages, he doesn't like the conclave, he just wants to drop it. So the story follows him giving this main character a couple of initiation tests in order to see if he's good enough to join the group. And then when he does, they go on a large journey to a tomb that is protected by a lot of magics, and the kid helps them break in and steal a bunch of stuff. Huh. And so the story's kind of like a tomb rabber story. That's so cool. But it's, it's really, the characters are really awesome, and the world, the magic is so cool. And it's just the first book, and I want to write so much more when it's done. <laughs> so, yeah, dude, yeah, I'm so... Like, the, the magic system is elemental. Okay. So you got fire, water, wind, earth. But there are some people that can... Um, like, every, every person that has magic is attuned to one of the elements. Okay. Kind of like an avatar or an airbender. Gotcha, you I'm familiar with that. You are a fire mage, you are a water mage, you are a wind or an earth mage, that's it. Uh, okay. If you do any enchantments and you're a fire mage, they can only be fire enchantments. You can only do fire uh, stuff because you're okay. a fire mage. There are, however, some special individuals that can control all the elements. Like the Avatar. Like the Avatar, but they're not that rare. It's not right. Like person <laughs> every hundred years or something like that. It's like more by blood. It's more... If, oh, that's if cool. If your parents have it, then you should have it as well. Okay, so like if you have like a fire and a waterbender parent, you have the option possibly. Yeah, you have kind the of, yeah. You're more like likely, ability. yeah, to have to have a, a couple. Or if you have a parent that can control all of them, then you're more likely. That's to pretty have cool. It. Um, and the whole key is that those people, when they control all the elements, they can turn it into a fifth element. And so that's why they're special because when they learn how to control all four of them, they can create a fifth. They can start like combining them and stuff. Yes. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. I have not figured out what I want to call those people yet. Um, right. At the moment, in my rough draft, they are referred to as Cinco's. Sweet. Cinco means five. Oh, uh, okay. A fifth element. That's so cool. Um, and this is a novel. Yes. It's long. Yeah. So, so Greyheart is seventeen thousand six hundred and fifty words. Okay. If you sit down in an afternoon and read it, it should be about an hour and a half, maybe two hours to read it. Right. In one sitting, and then you'll be done. What I'm writing now is a rough draft. It's not done, and it's more than 100,000 words. Oh. <laughs> so that hour and a half, maybe two hours, a couple of days. Right. Honestly. It's a real novel. It's like a dark plague. It's like a big thing. That's um, so awesome. So actually, on that vein, now that I'm thinking about it, mm -hmm. who designed your cover for Greyheart? I because it's really a cool. Website called Fiber, okay, F I B E R R, um, which 
has a lot of really creative artists and individuals on there that host gigs where you can hire them for like five bucks is the base price and they do a skill for you oh cool so, so you can get business cards you can get content writing you can get essays written for you or you can contact artists ah okay and they, the artist will say for five bucks i'll do a sketch for another five bucks i'll color it in for another five bucks i'll add these graphics for ten bucks i'll make it super high quality and then for another ten dollars you can use it on anything you want that's pretty amazing so that's kind of what i did was i found an, an artist that had a lot of uh, a good resume a lot of portfolio on there and he had good stuff and i told him here's what i want i want this sword i want this shield i want this background i want this color do it sweet and so they did a really good job he did yeah, I enjoyed it. And I had a couple of sketches done for it as well, which I put on my business card and on my website. Uh, sweet. I've seen nice. those. Um, and I'm actually considering maybe putting them in the book. Um, that would be cool. I thought about that at first, but I didn't think that they looked professional enough to put them in the book, so I kept them out. Gotcha. It's also a pain to learn how to format it all. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> um, but again, I could pay someone to do that, but in self-publishing, I just want to do it myself, so it's... Yeah, it was kind of a pain, and I didn't want to do it, so I didn't do it. But Smart. I might, I might add it to the Kindle version or the print version soon, because I posted them on Twitter, and a lot of people have been like, dude, those are awesome. Are those in your book? And no, they're not. Like, you right. should have put them in your book. Those are cool. They are really neat. I like sketches a lot. You got that, like, monster thing. Looks like yeah. a tree. Yeah. I, I kept those online because I was hoping people would go to my website to check out more about the book and more about and then be rewarded with cool sketches cool concept art and everything smart um, but that is not what happened right so, <laughs> so I might just put the pictures in the book and yeah just give it to people that way good idea the Captain Antilles sketch looks so badass thank you yeah it does the giant axe thing yeah that's so cool looking it definitely helps I like having a, a visual companion to what you're seeing exactly it what you're helped me when i was writing it as well oh right um, like building the maps and as how i was as i was just editing it in the end and just bringing things to a conclusion it really motivated me more to look up and see what my main character looked like because i feel like dude that's so badass right <laughs> now i need to finish this so i can show people that that's so cool right so that's awesome so that was fiverr fiver 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 Okay, cool. Kind of trying to think, like, if anyone listens to this that wants to write a book, like, where would they go? Who to talk to? Oh, yes. You know, people you recommend oh, yes. that you work with. Um, yeah, and if at any time anyone wants advice or, um, yeah, tips, what to do, let me know. Absolutely. I was just talking to Dustin Critcher a little while ago. Nice, um, nice. About writing what he wants to do with writing. So, it can be done. Yeah, absolutely. You're um, more than a testament to that. Yes, uh, a lot of people, a lot of people have surprised me by saying that they're really impressed and that they're very proud of me. Well, I, I'm just looking at a physical copy of a book that you wrote. That's fantastic. It's pretty awesome. I appreciate it. Like that didn't exist, and now it does. <laughs> Physically, there was a book that was not in existence, and then you put in work and you did it. What? Um, I'm sure you had days where you didn't want to write. <laughs> Yes. Or writer's block or anything like that? How did you get through that? Um, if you can read what that says. Just get it done. <laughs> motivational signs. Yeah, motivational signs. Just get it done. Just do it. Um, a lot of times it was rewarding myself. Uh, or like, okay, I'm not going to play video games until I get my quota in for the day. Or I am not going to watch a movie tonight unless I get my quota in. It helped to start in the morning. Yeah. Not put anything else before it and just start writing. It's, yeah, it's hard. And a lot of writers talk about how they really don't want to write. That's like the biggest struggle is actually sitting down and forcing yourself to write because the entire story is not really exciting. There are those info dump parts or there are those characterization scenes. Not everything is gory battle, awesome action, adrenaline rush. Right, you've got to get your character to the battlefield. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, a lot of times it's it's uh, I put myself in as much of a relaxing mindset as possible. 
and I plan a reward for, for when I'm done. Um, Smart. A lot of, some authors that I follow treat it like a day job and write for eight hours a day. Oh. And I don't know how they do that, if they have writer's block or if they're researching or something, I don't know how they do that, but um, I know other authors that just leave a quota, and that's what I've found is the best. Uh, I, s I try and write 10 pages every single day. Gotcha. Put like a manageable goal. Yes. And then a reward afterwards. If I can get 10 pages done, I feel good about myself and I'm done. If I feel like writing more after those 10 pages, sure, why not? If I've got nothing else to do. If I have to really work to get those 10 pages out and even if I only get like 8 pages or something, whatever, I wrote, I got some done, I'm not going to beat myself up about it. Right. I, I did my craft, I did my job, that's it. So work with yourself and make sure you write every day. Yeah, and that is, I, I looked up a lot of author advice, a lot of tips from every author, and they're, they're, they all say the same thing, you have to find a routine and you just have to write. You have to write every day, you have to write, and then write, and then write more, and then when you think you've written enough, you have to write three times a month. Gotcha. Right. <laughs> but at the same time, it's what I love. I love writing and reading and just being in words all day. Absolutely. I always equate it to like any sort of creative endeavor that takes work and time. Um, I always equate it to movies because that's what I know. You know what I mean? Like acting specifically, a majority of your time, you're literally just like sitting around waiting for the lights to get set up. So they tell you you have a call time at like 9 a.m. You don't even start filming till like 2. <laughs> But you gotta be there at nine because you gotta get makeup and you gotta get wardrobe and you gotta rehearse and know what you're doing while everyone's just setting up the shot. And then the shot takes maybe maybe an hour to film the whole sequence. Then you're like, all right, cool, we're done. It's so much work and so much like not doing what you want to do. You know what I mean? It's like it's always nice to what's that quote? It's like I don't like writing. I like having written. <laughs> That's me in editing. I hate editing videos. I love when the video's done, filming it's okay, but the editing just like physically, manually putting it together, but you have a book now, and that's pretty cool. So who is the guy who um, designed your thing? Do you remember his screen name or anything like that? No. Uh, he's in Indonesia. Okay. Is he on your website? He's not. I actually would not recommend him. Oh, okay. Then what's something people should look out for? when looking for stuff like this? Uh, people in Indonesia, maybe. <laughs> or just uh, artists that don't speak English well. Gotcha. Artists in other countries who are not that well with English. Yeah. Um, on, on Fiverr, most gigs come with one or two modifications included. Okay. And if you're still not happy, you can sometimes still contact the artist and be like, listen, this still isn't really that great. Can you just tweak this a little bit here? And if they're nice, sometimes they will. But this guy, the first time that I sent him an email, what I wanted and samples of it, he sent me back totally the wrong thing. Uh. Um, and I sent him an email like, dude, you did not even like read what I sent <laughs> you. You just made up your own stuff. That's not what I wanted at all. Um, and I was really upset. And that was actually one of the things that pushed my book back, I think like an extra week and a half or so because he wasn't done. And then he was like, okay, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll fix it. And then it took him seven days to fix it. And then I finally got it. I was like, dude, I just want to release my book. I'm just waiting for the cover. <laughs> and then finally he sent it. And I was like, okay, all right, that's good enough. Well, that's good, something that people who will now go there need to yes. be aware of. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, there's a lot of really good artists here in America or in France or in, you know, like other, I don't know, there's a lot of, like, I don't know, the, the guy that did my sketches is from Japan. Oh, okay. And he did awesome sketches. He is, like, the top-rated person on Fiverr. He has so many orders in his queue right now that if you ordered from him tonight, it would be, like, five days before he even said, okay, I'll take that order. And then it would be two weeks before he even finished it. He has so many orders. But he's really, really good. That's um, awesome. There's some people on there that are really, really good, but then there's other ones that just... It's a good gig for artists as well. Yes. Like if anybody wants to do something like that, Fiverr is a good place to Absolutely. get there's your name out make a little money. There's a lot for video editing as well on there, or for videos. Really? Like uh, if you want an advertisement done, you can write.
write to someone and say, I want a commercial for this, and they'll make a commercial for you. Huh. Or they'll make logos for you. Or you can get blog mentions. People who are professional bloggers will say, for five bucks, I'll put your blog here. For ten bucks, I'll put a big banner here. For thirty bucks, I'll mention you in a post, and I'll put you here for a week. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. So it's pretty much for, like, anyone that has a service to offer. That's a pretty cool system. And who, um, who's your editor or editors that helped you along? I used a, uh, an editor named Rob Bignell. Okay. Who has a lot of different services that he offers, not just editing. He does some publishing, and he has a couple of artists that he knows that also do book covers. But he worked mainly as a journalist and editor for a newspaper for about 20 years before becoming a freelance editor. Oh, nice. And he was a really nice dude, very kind. Edited well. And where did you find him? Twitter. Twitter. Awesome. It's a good old Twitter. And where can people find you? Everywhere. <laughs> uh, they can find me on Twitter at BG E S P I N O S A. Okay. B G Espinosa. Um, they can find me on Facebook as Victor Espinosa. They can find me on my website at bgespinosa.com. Um, they can find me on many other places online and forums for websites that involve science fiction or fantasy writings or readings or anime. Because I'm pretty big in anime. <laughs> uh, or they might find me circling around Monster Hunter forums as well. Perfect. And where can people buy Greyheart? Amazon, Smashwords, and my website. Um, on Amazon is probably the easiest. It is uh, 99 cents. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so. Yeah, they can check it out on Amazon, and or if they buy it from my website, I will send them a special goodie. Awesome. And that, I mean, yeah, and that's it. I will honestly give out some free copies for the payment of reviews. Cool. Um, if, if people like to review it on Amazon or Goodreads or any other site that it is online, or if they have a blog and they want to feature it, I have no problem giving out free copies for that. Cool, cool. For like contests and whatnot for retweets and all that yes yeah very cool awesome well i think that about does it actually so thanks for coming on man no problem man thank you for having me i am excited to see how awesome this podcast is well it's super awesome because you're on it well yeah but like <laughs> i want to meet all these other cool people that you're interviewing as well cool well see you later people adios guys